Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. I would like to welcome everyone to another episode. And this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips for helping us to find our inner peace. And I'm very pleased to once again be joined by our guest, John Vespasian. Uh, He's been with us Uh, multiple times. I'd probably have to say about three or so at this point. Uh, So very pleased to have him back. He is uh, an author and he is uh, just published his most recent book and it is called Sequentiality, The Amazing Power of Finding the Right Sequence of Steps. So I look forward to talking with John and digging a bit into what his book is about and how the message of his book can help all of us to uh, get closer to finding that inner peace that we have. So uh, welcome, John, and thanks again for being with us. Um, thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, the, the book um, is very much uh, closely linked to the idea of, um, of in, in inner peace and serenity, uh, because uh, what I present in the book, uh, this uh, book, Sequentiality, is a, 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 I would say, a rather controversial idea that um, um, in order to attain success, happiness, uh, personal development, uh, most of the time um, you have to be objective and calm and you will achieve better results if you just try to find uh, the right sequence of steps to follow. Instead of getting very much a uh, work app about uh, motivation, uh, enthusiasm, uh, positive thinking, um, which uh, very often are going to lead you in the wrong direction. The book uh, shows many different strategies, many different strategies that uh, people in history, it's based on history, on real cases, um, to, uh, to achieve enormous success and great happiness in different areas, um, professionally, uh, uh, in terms of uh, health, in terms of longevity, by simply finding uh, the right sequence of steps. So this is a a book about, um, I would say, an alternative approach uh, to personal development, um, which is based on being serene, calm, organized, and pretty much uh, trying to to avoid uh, reinventing the wheel. Right, and and that's really what I like about your books, is that in the ones that I've interviewed you on, uh, you're always bringing in real life examples. And that's one of the things that I like because I think anybody can make claims, but you back up your claims based on people from history and, and show how what you're positing actually can be done because it's been done before. So it's, you know, very much not reinventing the wheel. It's learning from that and moving forward. Yeah, let me just give you a couple of uh, stories from the book, a couple of ideas. I think um, uh, your audience will find them uh, helpful. Um, One of the stories I tell at the beginning uh, is the story of Luigi Cornaro, who lived in the in the 15th century, beginning of the of the 16th century. And Cornaro um, is a very special uh, character in history because. He is the first person recorded in history who lived um, 102 years. He became very, very old and very, very healthy. And the story is fascinating because um, Cornaro, when he was in his 30s, 
Uh, he was living in uh, northern Italy, in Venice. Um, when he was in his 30s, in his early 30s, uh, he was considered terminally ill. Uh, he had um, all sorts of pain, uh, colics. Uh, he could not eat anymore. He was very weak. Um, he was basically uh, waiting for death. He, he went to several physicians uh, to get some advice, and they all told him uh, to arrange his, um, his uh, business, uh, to dictate his last will, and they gave him a few weeks uh, to leave. Uh, they told him that uh, there was no cure. Uh, he was so sick. And the story is fascinating because then Cornaro uh, started to, um, to make little changes in his life, to explore uh, different steps, uh, which he recorded in a, in a diary. Uh, eventually, he recovered his health. Uh, it took him about six months uh, to become healthy again. And for the rest of his life, until he became uh, 102 years uh, old, uh, he remained extremely healthy. Even if he was in his 70s, uh, he fell from his horse and he broke um, an arm and a leg who was um, immobilized for a while, but he recovered uh, perfectly within a few weeks. So the story is fascinating, and uh, this is the kind of stories I tell in the book because what Cornaro did uh, was not uh, to be super positive and super optimistic because he had no, no, no reason to do that. What he did is um, to follow uh, little by little to try to find the right sequence of uh, steps uh, to recover his health. Even if everybody was telling him that uh, his case was hopeless, uh, he figured out um, common sense uh, improvements. He became uh, pretty much um, what today uh, we call a, a low-calorie diet. He embraced, um, uh, basically, he ate uh, vegetables. Uh, he drank some milk, uh, organic milk, of course. And he recovered his health, and he became um, uh, something that, uh, for the first time, was recorded in history. And he was in his 80s, well, his early 90s, uh, he, he wrote... Uh, some treatises about uh, how he had recovered his health. And he became um, uh, the first uh, example I have found for this kind of uh, personal development or health uh, development, uh, people who just um, uh, decide uh, to find the right steps uh, to do what they want to do, to get what they want to get. And they don't get very emotional. They don't get very excited. Uh, they just uh, doggedly, they follow uh, the direction they want to go and eventually they find a way. And this is the, I, I, in the books I tell example after example in different areas, uh, how people who are completely lost, uh, completely defeated, uh, eventually they turned their lives around by finding the right sequence of steps. And that, that's a fascinating story. And the point that I was hearing as you were talking is kind of the different approach that he took versus what people today take. Did you see it in the same way that we, we tend not to react in the way that he did? Yes, because um, uh, we want to have a clear formula. And this is what uh, I try to explain in the book, that um, uh, many times, very, very often, uh, in order to get what you want or to go into the direction you want, uh, you're going to have to explore uh, different um, uh, possibilities and you have to have some mistakes. Sometimes, um, as I explain in the book, uh, you have to go backwards uh, before you can go forward uh, because um, that's the nature of reality. Um, when you see these, adver these advertisements that uh, people sell uh, courses on how to become a millionaire on the internet and how to do this in three months and how to do this in three hours, um, I mean, these things don't work, or they work maybe for a little while, but then uh, they become ineffective. Because in real life, when you see history and you see uh, many different examples, um, you see people uh, solving incredibly uh, difficult problems uh, just because they, they stay calm, they stay rational, and little by little, they, they turn um, the situation around. What we don't like, because our culture is very short-term oriented, very short-term oriented, what we don't like is confusion. Uh, people hate confusion. Uh, they want to know exactly what to do. Uh, they, we feel very uncomfortable in uh, situations that uh, don't have a clear direction. But this is life. Uh, let me just give you an example from, um, from the movies. 
I think most people have uh, watched the movie Casablanca. Uh, it's from 1942. Good movie. It's a, it's a movie with uh, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, a very successful movie. And when you watch this movie, um, it has one uh, special uh, characteristic that few people know. It's one of the few movies in Hollywood that was uh, shot in sequence, which means that uh, they started with scene number one, and they went two, and then three, and the whole team uh, stayed together during the whole movie. This is extremely unusual, because nowadays uh, when the people uh, <laughs> make movies, they group the scenes and uh, they group the scenes by location. They break down uh, the production uh, so that uh, the main actors are not busy for longer than necessary. So they sort of uh, shoot the scenes separately and then they put them together uh, with the special effects. So it's very unusual that people do uh, sequential movies. But uh, Casablanca was a sequential movie. And one of the um, uh, things that make the movie so uh, interesting is that uh, the actors, uh, Humphrey Bogart and uh, Ingrid Berman, they were very confused uh, during, the, um, during the shooting, during the production, because they didn't know the end of the movie. Uh, because actually, while they were um, uh, shooting the movie, uh, they were still writing the script, because the producer uh, has not, uh, had not yet decided uh, how to end the movie. And what, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. And this is why the movie is so amazingly realistic. Because when they are doing the, the love uh, scenes in the movie, uh, they are completely confused because they don't know if they're going to be together at the end or they don't know if they're going to separate. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen. Uh, when they look confused uh, in the camera, in front of the camera, it is because they were actually confused. And this makes um, uh, the movie fascinating because he's so close to real life. This is how uh, most of us uh, feel when we have to face um, uh, difficult situations. And in the end, the movie is solved uh, very successfully. Uh, at the end, the story uh, fits together. But uh, the producer was hesitating about uh, the end of the movie until the very last minute. And actually, he wrote uh, the last uh, sentence of the movie, uh, which most people remember, which is, um, it is the beginning of a, of a beautiful story. Um, uh, he wrote the sentence a few days uh, before the end of the production. And this is how the story closed uh, so beautiful. Uh, but this is an example of, uh, I think, personal development at its best, because the confusion that uh, you see on the screen in this movie in Casablanca, this is a confusion that people hate. Uh, nobody wants to be in a situation where you have to make decisions uh, all the time. You don't know the result. Uh, you are taking initiatives, but you are not sure uh, what's going to happen. But this is real life. And this is why the movie is so charming and so uh, fantastically appealing because it's so realistic, because it's pure uh, sequentiality. Which fits regular life. I mean, life goes sequentially where we don't know the end uh, of what's going to happen. And, and that's really fascinating. I, I've seen the movie, but had never heard that before. And you almost wonder how that would affect other movies if they were to film them in that way. But... Uh, why do you think we messed that up in life? What, you know, what, what it seemed to make sense to me that that is how we do things is it sequentially? Um, we get messed up because uh, I think this is a, a problem with uh, human psychology uh, that I address in my books uh, very often, that um, uh, is, if we have to define in, uh, human intelligence, or well, intelligence in general, because some animals are also um, uh, intelligent to a certain extent, if we define intelligence, uh, you will see that um, uh, one of the best definitions is uh, intelligence is the ability to, uh, to find, uh, to detect, to identify patterns. Uh, and this is how we, we learn language because we identify different patterns. This is how you learn the second language or a third language. You identify sound patterns and you build um, your knowledge, you build your vocabulary, you build your uh, expertise by putting ideas together and identifying uh, patterns uh, which are increasingly complex. And this is very good uh, that we are intelligent, but at the same time, um, we have this uh, propensity uh, to, to want uh, things to be linear. Uh, because our, mind, uh, our minds are logical. Uh, we want that uh, 2 plus 2 always makes 4 uh, without any uh, deviations, without any discrepancies, without any 
uh, surprises. But uh, when we're dealing with um, uh, human situations where you have so many factors, uh, temporal factors, you have um, uh, people taking different initiatives, uh, you have people discontinuing things they are doing, you have uh, uh, technological innovation, uh, you have uh, to deal with the environment uh, in your society, in your business, in your career. When you are dealing with so many things, uh, we stubbornly uh, want everything to be linear and symmetric and predictable, while uh, history shows uh, that this is rarely the case. And the people who actually become um, uh, successful uh, in many cases is not because uh, they are super uh, linear and super um, uh, motivated. It is because they know how to deal uh, with disruptions and with uncertainty and with um, uh, failure and adversity. And this is um, something that I present in the book, I think, very uh, strongly that uh, you have to develop this kind of uh, psychological flexibility because this is the only way uh, to deal uh, with the ups and downs of life uh, without getting uh, completely um, uh, emotionally, uh, I would say, to get the nervous breakdown, uh, which happens to millions of people every year, uh, that uh, we become so linear in our thinking that we cannot tolerate uncertainty, uh, we cannot tolerate a confusion, and we cannot tolerate failure. And this is um, something that uh, our minds uh, do to ourselves because we tend to be um, logical in a very detrimental way. Right. So what would be, and, and I'm not asking you to give out your entire book here, but what might be part of that sequence? I mean, what should we do like first and second that would help guide us on this path of more linear, logical thought? Well, um, one of the uh, best examples I present in the book uh, is the story of um, uh, Giacomo Casanova. Casanova lived in the 18th century. He became very famous um, uh, as a seducer, as a very successful um, uh, seducer, a romantic, uh, romantically successful. But uh, the story of Casanova is fascinating because uh, you see a guy who uh, was completely unsuccessful in his youth. Uh, he came from a um, low middle class family uh, in the, in Venice. Uh, her mother, his father, um, uh, didn't pay any attention to him. Uh, his mother was working in the theater, uh, which in the 18th century was the lowest uh, profession you can imagine. And uh, this Casanova, um, uh, at the beginning of his career, he was extremely unsuccessful. Uh, he could not get, he could not keep a job. Uh, he was getting fired all the time. Uh, he had all kinds of uh, financial problems. Uh, he was uh, extremely unsuccessful. Uh, within a decade, uh, he became uh, one of the most uh, socially successful people in Europe. Uh, he moved to another country. He built another career. Uh, and eventually, he, uh, he ended up making a fortune, all thanks to his uh, entrepreneurship. And we are lucky to know uh, all, my, all these uh, details about Casanova because when he was in his, um, in his last years, uh, he retired uh, to work in a library. Uh, he has spent uh, almost the last 10 years of his life writing his memories. Uh, he wrote um, uh, 3,000 pages, 100 pages, um, which um, many of them are still uh, available because they have been kept, uh, luckily, they have been kept uh, in different libraries. But uh, Casanova is fascinating as an example of sequentiality because he shows uh, how um, you can learn from failure and build little by little on your knowledge, uh, which is the whole point of sequentiality. How Casanova became very, very successful with, uh, with women uh, by learning, by trying different techniques, by improving his conversational um, uh, abilities, uh, by becoming extremely diplomatic, uh, extremely subtle in the way he spoke, uh, by reading uh, constantly. He was a, a very um, voracious reader. Uh, he had a very fascinating conversation. And when he went uh, from Venice to Paris, he went to live in France. He learned French at the beginning with some difficulty. Eventually, he got um, um, a, a job in France and he, got, he started uh, a business and became very, very successful. So the, this is the kind of story I present in the book. And the, what we can learn from people from uh, like Casanova 
is that uh, we have to learn to look um, long term in our lives. We have to learn to think in, in terms of decades and to use our assets and to use our talents and to develop uh, them little by little. And Casanova is uh, the typical uh, sequentiality uh, example because he was extremely unsuccessful uh, in Venice. Uh, basically, he failed uh, financially. He was fired from his job. Um, he was a total disaster. And it's only when he moved to a better environment, when he moved to Paris, uh, that he was able to use uh, his great abilities. Um, and he used his uh, knowledge of uh, the um, uh, games because in, in, um, in, uh, in Venice, uh, they had a lottery already for many years. And when he went to Paris, uh, Casanova had the idea of starting a lottery in France, which was something new. Uh, and he convinced uh, an investor. So eventually he started uh, National Lottery in France. Uh, he became uh, uh, very, very wealthy within um, very few years. Uh, this is just because he learned um, uh, how to develop his ability. And by using his knowledge and his assets, he put himself in the right uh, context and eventually became very successful. And this sequence of events um, is something that you find in many cases in history and uh, it shows that uh, people should not get discouraged if they don't become successful in the short term, uh, because if you just keep going in the right direction, um, you increase dramatically uh, your chances of uh, success and happiness. But how do we know that we're going in the right direction? So like you say, you know, Casanova wasn't good, so he moves over to France and, you know, things change. How are we supposed to move from being kind of stuck in that into... Uh, you know, moving into where our success would be? Well, the, um, what I have learned from this, all these cases is that uh, you have to find uh, the sweet spot uh, between um, what you want to do or what you like to do, which sometimes is going to be very vague because uh, most people have uh, a very uh, fussy idea of what they want. They, they like to do some kind of um, uh, activity or some kind of they're interested in some kind of uh, um, subject, but they don't know exactly what they want to do. So if you just move into the into this direction and you eventually find the market uh, that is avid for this kind of um, uh, knowledge or this kind of skill, uh, you will become very successful. And uh, I have shown uh, in this book um, uh, that's the story. Let me just uh, tell you another story. Look in the in the field of um, ocean research, oceanography. Uh, the biggest name in the, in the 20th century is uh, Jacques Cousteau, who was a French um, um, a scientist. Right. And the story of Cousteau is fascinating because he's also a typical example of sequentiality. Uh, Cousteau um, enrolled in, uh, in the military, so the marine um, school when he was in his uh, 20s because he wanted to, he wanted to be a captain uh, in a ship. He wanted to work for the, um, for the Navy. So he, he enrolled in this Navy school, um, but um, as soon as he graduated, uh, he had a car accident. Uh, he had a road accident, um, very, very uh, heavy. Uh, his, car, his car crashed. Uh, he broke uh, his two arms and his two legs. Uh, he was uh, in hospital uh, for a very long time. Uh, and while he was in hospital, he was very frustrated because he thought that his career was going to be um, suffering from this uh, immobility. Uh, he was a very active guy and he was there for a long time because when you break uh, your arms and your legs, um, I mean, you're, you break one leg, uh, it's not a big deal, but if you break uh, both arms and both legs, basically you cannot do anything and people have to feed you in hospital. I mean, it's really a very annoying uh, situation. And eventually when Cousteau uh, recovered, and was able to, uh, to get out of hospital, what the doctor told him is that uh, he had to do gentle exercise without pushing too much to avoid um, uh, his arms from breaking again. Uh, he took up uh, swimming and diving. And this is when the story begins because uh, Cousteau just wanted to be a military guy. He wanted to work in the Navy. He wanted to be a, a captain. And then he started um, to get into diving and swimming uh, which he wasn't planning to do, uh, just to recover his health. Uh, he got interested a bit in diving. Um, he started to, uh, to wonder if he could take some pictures uh, underwater. Uh, he, um, he bought a camera, a second-hand camera, 
uh, to be able to take some uh, images underwater. And then he started to make uh, short movies about uh, fish underwater, about um, uh, recovery of uh, wrecks underwater. Uh, he started these uh, funny films in the 1970s that uh, people started to find super interesting because it was completely uh, innovative that someone was making movies underwater. And within um, a very short time, uh, Cousteau became the most famous um, oceanographer in the, oceanographer in, the, in the world because he started to make a TV series uh, about uh, life underwater. And then the TV was running very, very soon in the US, uh, in France, in Germany. And during the rest of his life, um, uh, Cousteau was hesitating whether to leave the Navy, which was his dream, or to, to follow his passion. What he had found uh, through sequentiality, maybe uh, by following uh, different steps that he didn't plan, and eventually uh, he, uh, he quit the Navy uh, to work uh, full-time as a uh, movie producer, and he made uh, <clears throat> several TV series that uh, you can still see uh, running today on uh, cable TV uh, right. when the guy uh, passed away already uh, 10 years ago. So it's, um, this is a fascinating example and it's something that happens every day. Right, exactly. And, and that was a wonderful show. Um, what, what do you think would be something that we can do to push ourselves when we feel that we're being stuck? And, and I know that's, you know, a chapter in, in your book. But what would be some of the things we can do if, you know, somebody listening to this is sitting there saying, well, all this makes sense. I totally agree with him. But what do I do to push myself? Or, or if we see a friend or family member in this situation, what, what would we do? Well, um, the first thing uh, we have to do is to, uh, to get rid of um, hypersensitivity, which is um, something that blocks uh, sequentiality from happening. When we become uh, super focused on our emotions, on our uh, fears, uh, on our um, uh, resistance uh, to, uh, to taking action, uh, then you cannot do anything. This is the first obstacle you have to remove. Uh, one of the stories I tell in my book is a, is a guy called Rossetti, who was a super talented uh, painter and poet in the 19th century. And the guy started a great career when he was in his uh, 20s and 30s, but eventually he got a few uh, bad reviews. Uh, he became an alcoholic and uh, basically he, he, he stopped uh, painting and he stopped uh, writing poetry and eventually he died very, very young. And, uh, his name was Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And this is what happens uh, to a lesser extent to many people. I mean, uh, we ask ourselves, what could I do? What could I do? And we become so super stressed, uh, so super fearful. And the first thing you have to, to, to do is to, um, to overcome your hypersensitivity. You should not pay too much attention to... Uh, to criticism, uh, to adversity, to opposition, and you should try to make a plan which looks feasible. Even if it's not the best plan in the world, uh, you should just try uh, different things until you see um, which one works. And eventually, uh, what history shows is that uh, most problems have been already solved. If you know um, uh, in which direction you want to go, uh, you just have to research uh, people who have um, been successful in that area uh, to get an idea of what you have to do. Even if you don't follow the exact uh, formula, uh, it doesn't matter. As long as you keep moving in the right direction, little by little, uh, eventually you will get there. Because most careers uh, are not uh, built uh, within uh, five years or 10 years. Sometimes it takes uh, 20, 30 years to build uh, a successful career. But if you just uh, take step uh, by step every day, you will eventually figure out uh, the right sequence of events. Right. And that would be something that we can do then, you know, to help others and, and to help ourselves in making uh, that progress. And, you know, one of the things that I've found fascinating with the book is the positive nature that you're, you know, coming out showing, you know, how people's lives might have started out one way, but then through the shifts that they're making or as they start, thinking differently, the, the lives end up very different. So would one of the aspects that we need to focus on, what would that be that, you know, just because your life is where it is at the moment doesn't mean it's always going to be that way? 
Yeah, it, it means also that uh, you have to, uh, to learn to copy um, what uh, successful people are doing. Uh, even if you uh, imagine that, I don't know, you want to, to learn Spanish or you want to learn the new profession or you want to get into a new market, um, it is not so difficult uh, to figure out uh, the right steps. Uh, the problem is that uh, we want to get a formula which is ready made uh, and this usually is not possible. Uh, because every person is going to be in a completely different situation, is going to have different background, is going to have a uh, different uh, family or financial obligations, and you have to figure out uh, what works for you. But this is not so super, super difficult. And one of the um, uh, stories I tell in the book, which I think is uh, super relevant for this um, aspect, uh, is how uh, people actually went to, the, to, the, to Antarctica, to the South Pole, um, in the early... Uh, 20th century, and they try different ways. And it's, it's fascinating to see uh, which ways uh, succeeded and which ways failed. And one of the, the things that uh, we find in people who became very successful and who went um, to the South Pole uh, and they went there, they just put their flag and they, they went back without any uh, major problem, while other people got frozen and they died uh, one after the other, is that uh, they simply check um, the details, they made uh, a backup plan, so they went there, so it was the Norwegian uh, explorer uh, Amundsen, he went there, he made a backup plan, he put uh, some uh, food depots uh, in different areas in case there was a storm, and he just uh, went uh, straight ahead to the South Pole, because he knew that uh, if there was any problem, he could always fall back in his, um, with his uh, emergency uh, food depot. And the guy was, um, uh, had never been there before. You have to realize that uh, the, his preparations, he has to do it um, months in advance. But uh, he figured out a very simple way to do it because he checked uh, with people who have been in, in, in similar situations. So, okay, how cold is it? Uh, what are the, the problems I'm going to encounter? How I'm going to prepare for that? And he simply copied. I mean, the guy did not uh, innovate. He just put uh, the, uh, the ideas together. While the other people who tried to do it, uh, they tried to do their own thing. They didn't check anything. So they, there was, a, for instance, a guy from, um, from Britain. His name was uh, Scott. Uh, he uh, sort of uh, tried to do the same thing as the Norwegians. But instead of checking um, all the details to try to prevent uh, mistakes, uh, he just said, OK, I can figure this out myself. So I go there. And uh, he went there um, with, uh, I mean, what he did was a, a series of mistakes, which nowadays they look like a joke. But he, the guy wanted to go to uh, the South Pole uh, with some um, um, skates with some engines. So the engine broke within five minutes. Uh, then he didn't have enough dogs, so the dogs started to die. And he, he took some ponies uh, to, the, to the South Pole. So the ponies eventually, uh, they could not even walk uh, five meters so the guy froze to death in a most uh, shameful way while the Norwegians were basically going back uh, at top speed. And these kind of mistakes you don't have to make. You don't have to repeat uh, mistakes that you can easily avoid. And these people paid uh, with their lives, uh, their arrogance, because they didn't want to check um, the environment. While nowadays, uh, when you have access to internet and you have access to information, you can steer your life very easily, step by step, and you should not uh, be discouraged by the difficulties because most problems, as I said, most problems have been already solved. Uh, if you just uh, see what uh, successful people are doing, you can find the right sequence of steps. And this is the, the whole point of the book, uh, to show that uh, with rationality, with um, serenity, and uh, with logic, uh, you can turn your life around without getting um, super emotional. And that makes a lot of sense. And as I mentioned earlier, that's one of the things that I really enjoy about your books is, you know, we're learning from others. And that's one of the things that I lament about current society is we don't seem to uh, understand or learn from our history. We just seem to keep repeating it. And there's that lack of wanting to know about history, where for me, if we learn the history, then we're going to learn what has worked and what hasn't worked and, you know, improve our lives uh, from there on. 
Yeah, indeed. And um, it's very important that uh, we check uh, examples that are feasible and that are realistic. Um, nowadays, um, there are a, a lot of um, uh, things that we don't know about um, uh, health, about um, uh, the universe, and people sometimes they get uh, hooked up on the um, on the mysteries of uh, of, uh, of life, while uh, you don't need to know all the answers in order to get uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, for instance, I remember that um, uh, in Europe a few uh, decades ago there was a, there was a guy. Uh, his name was uh, Bruno Goering, and I tell the, the Goering, and I tell the story in the book. Um, he was able to cure uh, people. He was um, one of these uh, healers. Uh, he was able to cure people um, uh, who had uh, terminal cancer, uh, leukemia. And I mean, he cured the hundreds of people. And he just put his hands on their heads and they just walk away and they, they, they walk up to the hospital. And, and people say, okay, how, how could he do it? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know how he could do it, but I'm sure I cannot do it. And uh, I could not um, uh, find any um, explanation because I researched the story uh, very, very thoroughly. And it's a guy who lived, um, um, he, he died in the 19, early 19, uh, late 1950s, but he was super famous in, uh, in Germany and Switzerland. Uh, he had, uh, at a certain point, he had uh, thousands of people uh, go into his house every day because he, they just wanted to be cured. And the guy uh, would cure uh, cases that were completely uh, desperate. Now, uh, my point is that uh, these things happen. And you see sometimes uh, completely mysterious and completely uh, weird uh, things that happen. And you say, okay, maybe this could happen to me. But uh, the point in the book is that, um, yes, sometimes uh, you will be lucky and you will be uh, in touch with one of these uh, healers. and He will turn your life around. But uh, you should not expect that. You have to find um, uh, ways to get what you go, what you want. You have to find ways to go into the right direction without depending on magic. Because from time to time, you might be lucky and you might uh, meet one of these uh, healers or one of these uh, gurus or one of these um, uh, opportunities that are so unique. But uh, you have to find a way to do it uh, in normal circumstances. You have to find uh, examples uh, to follow a sequence of events, a sequence of steps that uh, you can steer yourself. You should not um, put your life on hold uh, waiting for um, uh, one of these uh, miracles uh, because sometimes uh, I see that miracles do happen because I have seen uh, many cases, things that, that are ex impossible to explain uh, logically, but uh, we have to find ways uh, to get things done uh, with normal uh, tools. And that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I got out of that is something that I've talked a lot about is don't just sit back and let life happen, but take action so that, it, you know, you can change things in your life. And, and we're not just the victims of what is happening around us, but we can be active participants and, you know, making that change. And that's what I was hearing, uh, you know, from what you were saying at that point. Yes, and um, uh, what I want to uh, convey as a message uh, to your audience is that um, we have to be practical. We have to focus on, on practical solutions. We have to find the sequence of uh, steps uh, that we can follow in practical terms. And this is um, not so difficult. It is just uh, our psychological resistance uh, that keeps us stuck uh, because we tend to believe that uh, we cannot do anything to improve our situation. Uh, it is too difficult. Uh, we don't have the resources. Uh, we don't have the time. I can assure you that um, I have researched uh, the cases in the book uh, very thoroughly. And I have come up with story after story of people who have uh, been able to overcome uh, very, very uh, tragic situations uh, where they have no opportunities, where they have uh, no education sometimes. They have no resources, and little by little, uh, they have been able to put together uh, fantastic uh, businesses, fantastic families, uh, sometimes to recover their health. And this is, um, this is the, the way uh, human uh, experience uh, develops. Uh, we don't follow a straight line. Uh, we try different things. We try to find the sequence of something that works, 
And by trial and error and persistence, eventually we get there. And this is the message of the book that um, we have to be patient, you have to be persistent, and you have to stay calm. Don't go crazy um, um, into a spiral of uh, negativity and depression uh, because then you will get completely stuck and you will not be able to improve anything. That, that's wonderful uh, philosophy for life. And I think, you know, definitely to encourage people to check out your book. Uh, and again, the title of the book is Sequentiality, The Amazing Power of Finding the Right Sequence of Steps. How can people find your book? Well, it's super easy. Uh, if you just type uh, my name, uh, John Vespasian on Google, uh, you will find the books, you will find my blog, you will find my uh, free newsletter. I just type uh, John Vespasian on Google and you will find all my books uh, very, very easily. Awesome. And I do know that the book is on Amazon. That's where I picked it up. I will put uh, links into the show notes so people uh, can very quickly find that. But I, I would encourage all the listeners to you know, take a moment and look at all of your books, you know, not just this one, but uh, there's eight or nine books now. Some, am I right? Somewhere around there? Yes, there are nine books at the moment. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and again, all of these books, you know, are, are using examples from other people. And it's very important to learn from other people, you know, whether it's learning from the positives that others learned or, you know, what do we learn from the negative, you know, as to where did they mess up? And then we don't, have to uh you know follow that we can uh learn and hopefully not mess up in the same way but i i thank you very much john for being with us again and uh i look forward to thank you for listening to this podcast episode and I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening. And have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.